Blessed Father's Day to you fathers on this Father's Day. Now, for most of my life, sad to say, I've pretty much heard the same sermon preached on this feast day, namely, how the Holy Trinity is a mystery and we do not know much about it. How unfortunate. Unfortunate because we certainly do know many things of this most profound mystery. We know something of God's inner life. We know something of the inner life of the Trinity. Simply because we are made in His image. And also because he, God Himself has revealed it to us. Furthermore, we are remade in His likeness. Not just we are made in His image, but we're remade in His likeness through the waters of baptism. Which comes about, as we just heard... In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Even if what we know about the Holy Trinity be only a sliver of this profound mystery and beauty of God, we can know something, and knowing even this sliver can be of immeasurable help in understanding many things about ourselves, our own existence, and of course, about that of our God. Thus, we should not dismiss the mystery of the Trinity as being too much for us or too mysterious, but we should want to know as much as we can. We should want to know more. Moreover, the church has gone through many trials touching upon the nature of the Holy Trinity. Most especially in the early centuries, there was a lot of heresies around this mystery. In this way, the church has provided us with an accurate theology of the three persons in one God. All this effort is not just for professors and seminaries and colleges and universities and for theologians, but it's for us too. Now, it's commonly known, sad to say, that over the last few decades, the church's teaching has been neglected by many. Often people just believe what they want, picking and choosing what suits them in this life. So we should not be surprised at some of the errors of the early church, touching upon the Most Holy Trinity, have returned in our own time. Now let's discuss one of these errors that has seemingly returned today. Now, the one I have in mind is corrected by the phrase in the creed we say or we sing every Sunday. The phrase is, And I believe in the Holy Ghost who proceeds from the Father and the Son. Underline that, and the Son. The Latin for and the Son is filioque. Filioque. The error of saying the Holy Ghost does not proceed from the Father and the Son still exists today, stubbornly held by the Eastern Orthodox. Please note that I, am not, I do not think that this error has returned in a formal way inside the Catholic Church of our time. Nobody professes this error on the inside of the Church openly. In other words, people are not falling into it on purpose. But rather, it seems to me, it has come to be in a material way, in a de facto way. We find it present in a number of ways. In other words, since filioque corrects an error regarding the procession of the Holy Ghost, it seems to me that many today seemingly think or act as if the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father alone instead of from the Father and the Son. And before I explain what I mean, we need to review our Trinitarian theology, which involves simply counting one to five. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, one. There's only one God. He's one in nature or substance. He's one in being. 
which for God is simply to exist. God is existence itself. He, his being, is pure act, pure being, pure existence. And that is why he said to Moses on the mountain, I am who am. Now, as we say in the preface today at the Mass, Thou art one God, one Lord, one substance, unity in essence. So that's one. What about two? Well, there are two processions in God. We know by the teaching of the church, flowing from divine revelation, expressed in the creed, that the only Son of God, the Word, is eternally begotten or generated of the Father. This procession is called generation. Then the Holy Ghost proceeds eternally from the Father and the Son, filioque. This is called spiration, a breathing forth. It is essential to keep in mind that there is a hierarchy or there is order in the processions of God. Generation must precede spiration. Without the generation, you cannot spirate. For spiration is the breathing out of love between the Father and the Son. Thus, generation and God must precede spiration. Truth precedes love. There's the knower in God, that's the Father. There's the known in God, that's the Son. There's the love they share, that's the Holy Ghost. The knower, the known, and the love they share. So, before we can love something, we need to know it. That's number two. Number one, one nature in God. Number two, two processions. Let's skip three for a moment. You already know what it is, three persons. Let's go to four. With each procession in God, generation, spiration, with each of these processions comes two relations. Two relations. Relationships. Since there are two processions in God, then there are four relations. This is not that hard to understand when we look at our own families, look at our own life, human generation. So we think about today, our dads. There's a relationship between us and our fathers. We, we were generated from him. So there's paternity on his side and there's filiation, sonship, on our side. Two relations. That's why we call him father. And that's why he calls us son or daughter. Now the same is true for the procession in God, the generation. There's the father, and there's the son. Now, the same is true for the procession of the Holy Ghost from the father and the son. Two relations result. And that makes four relations. Okay. One, two, we jump to four. Let's go back to three. If the relation in God is unique and unrepeatable, then that relation is a person in God. That is why we define a human or an angelic person as someone who is unique and unrepeatable, because it comes from God, it comes from Trinitarian theology. This is why we should abhor abortion, for example. That someone that is unique and unrepeatable is snuffed out. Also, we can think of personhood, personality. The more we're able to relate, the more our personality develops. The more we cannot relate, the more our relation, our personality devolves. There's a difference between a saint who can approach anyone and someone like the Unabomber who goes up into a cabin in Montana and sends out bombs. You see, his personality was devolving. 
The other one, his personality is becoming more like God. Nobody is unapproachable to a saint. That comes from the Trinitarian theology of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, as it turns out, with the Holy Ghost, processing from the Father and the Son, there are only three unique and unrepeatable relations in God. Because one of the four relations is shared between the Father and the Son. It's not unique. This alone tells us what is wrong with the idea that the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father without the Son, as the Eastern Orthodox hold it to be so. Because if that were true, (laughs) then there would be four persons in God, not three. So now we're done with our counting from one, two, three, four. We'll leave five off for another day. It's very interesting things in five, five notions in God. But we've got enough now to help us understand what's going on in the church today. As mentioned above, we have to understand that there is hierarchy in God. There's order in God because of these processions. The Father is at the top, followed by the Son, who is eternally generated from Him, the knower and the known, the lover and the thing loved, And then the Holy Ghost proceeds from them. He's the love they share. This is why we make the sign of the cross the way we do. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In that order. The Son was sent before the Holy Ghost. We have Easter before Pentecost. And this also means the highest goal is God the Father. All is aimed at the Father. All has come from the Father. All has flowed forth from the Father. All will return to the Father. That is good, holy, and righteous. He is the ultimate goal of all creation. Okay, now, why is all this important? At least two reasons. First, it touches, it touches on how and why we approach God. Ultimately, seeking God the Father. Why do people approach God? One word, love, charity. God is charity. God is love. And we know that all good things come from Him. And all mankind desires that infinite, unending love that is God. It's built into our systems. We want it. Although everybody, it seems, constantly is looking for it in all the wrong places. God the Father is the lover. God the Son is the beloved. God the Holy Ghost is the love they share. So, okay, now we're ready to address the modern error. Here it is. If the Holy Ghost is love, is the love of God, why can't I just go to the Holy Ghost and be done with it? Think about it. Today's mentality and culture tells us to what? Avoid pain. Inconvenience, that's to be avoided. Hardships at all costs should be done away with. No penance, no discipline. Thus, the desire and effort of modern man to find an easy, painless, and feel-good way to the Father apart from the Son. then they will seek the Holy Ghost as the shortcut to God. Shortcut to God the Father. Now it's clear to me, there is very much something of this behind the modern charismatic movement. Pentecostalism. What is interesting is how much this movement has been promoted as a way of thinking and acting in the opulent West. Furthermore, The origins of this recent movement come from the Protestants who claim incessantly that they can go straight to the Father. We can approach the Father directly. These same folks often end up almost denying the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ or treating it as merely a historical event or a key that opens the door to their going straight to the Father. 
rather than what it really is. The incarnation is something that continues in the church down through the very end of time. That's what the baptism is all about, being born with Christ. something in which we all must participate in if we are going to be saved. To follow this movement, this way of thinking, is to fall into the error that was corrected by the filioque addition to the creed. The Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son. The Holy Ghost always leads us back to the Son. The Holy Ghost unveils the Son who is the way to heaven and the way to God the Father. And that is the only way. What is the way of the Son? Resurrection, ascension by way of Calvary. Cannot escape it. By way of Calvary. By way of voluntary suffering. United to Christ's suffering. Most especially as it is represented in the Holy Mass. The Holy Ghost always leads us back to the Son to become another Christ so that we can finish the journey and come home to the Father. This is what the saints have shown us by their very lives. This is what Our Lady is constantly telling us in her approved apparitions. Penance, penance, penance. She's always leading us to the Calvary of her Son. So not only is the incarnation continued down through the ages of the church until the very end, but also so is Calvary. That's why we have the Mass. Thus, through all time, the Holy Ghost does what? Compels His saints to go out into the deserts and be tempted and suffer and conquer. Hmm? That's what He does. He compels the members of the church in imitation of our Lord Jesus Christ to climb the mountain of God, to embrace the cross, to die completely to self, to become a martyr of Christ so that we can rise with Christ. If, however, the Holy Ghost were able to lead us to the Father apart from Calvary, We would not need to climb the mountain of God, which has total crucifixion, total death to self at its summit. With Christ our Lord lifted up, drawing all men to Himself. Did He not say that? When I am lifted up, I will draw all things to Myself. I guess He didn't mean everything after all. We don't need to go to Calvary after all. We can take a shortcut. Instead, what happens? Well, this is what the charismatic leaders do. Charismatics in general. I'm not trying to judge any one individual. But in general, the charismatics just camp out at the bottom of the mountain. Don't need to climb up there after all. I have arrived. It's as if I'm already there. I've got all these gifts and everything. I got the Holy Ghost. What a deception. See here the reason for the popularity of this movement? No Calvary, no penance, no cross. Yet it is de facto a denial of the filioque in the creed. I can go to the Father through the Holy Ghost without the Son. The gospel is clear that God the Father did not hesitate to send His only Son, even though it meant His death. This is the way back to God the Father for us too. And He sends the Holy Ghost to strengthen us in the task and even to compel us along the way. There are no shortcuts around Calvary, only temptations to calm down and camp out. Now furthermore, As we've mentioned, the Son proceeds from the Father and from them both, the Father and the Son, filioque, the Holy Ghost proceeds. So, in other words, veritas, truth, proceeds caritas, love. Again, we've got another error in modern times. It's all over the place. Many today want to give and spread love. Let's just love without the truth. 
As a preacher and a confessor, the pressure is sometimes very tangible. The pressure to say nice things, seemingly loving things to the people, to make them feel good. But such behavior does not bring the love of God. Truth always precedes love in God. And therefore, so also in the world He created. If there's to be love, we must start with the truth. Now, we may know someone who is in trouble. Maybe they're a member of our family. And we may know why they're in trouble. But how hard it is for us to tell them, first of all, the truth. With love, of course. Not with harshness, bitterness. And But then, if we do that, God the Father sends the Son and the Son and the Father and the Son together send the Holy Ghost. And the love comes and fills that person or moves them, compels them to come back to church, back to confession. This is the normal way God works. He sent His Son, the truth. Then the Holy Ghost came at Pentecost to fill them with love and lead them to understand all truth. This is why the church always makes an effort to catechize anyone who enters the church before they receive the sacraments, or even her members as they receive the sacraments. Truth in God precedes love in God. Again, love flows from the Father and the Son, and not just the Father. What does this say of all the modern craze for ecumenism and dialogue with the strange religions of this world? We know the truth. We're going to profess the truth in a moment with the Athanasian Creed at the end of Mass. But let's look at the truth that's been revealed to us in the sacred scriptures. This is from St. John's first letter. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. You know what? Most of these strange religions of the world outwardly deny Christ is the Son of God. Or they deny there is a Son of God. They deny there is a Trinity. Hello! They do not have the Father. Another one. This is from the second letter of St. John. Whosoever revolteth and continueth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. Now, some say, I believe in the Trinity, but they revolt from the doctrine of Christ such as the Mass, the Eucharist, or even baptism. These people don't have God. St. Paul says, this is from 1 Corinthians, If any man love not our Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. How do you get around that? There's people out there in these other religions, all of them, Muslims, Jews, they hate our Lord Jesus Christ. They regularly attack Him, reject Him, write against Him, blaspheme against Him. Oh, well, let's go pray with these people. This is ridiculous. They do not have God. King David says, all the gods of the Gentiles are devils. There it is. And the devils are liars. There's no truth in this. Therefore, there's no love in this. It won't work. St. Cyprian says, He who does not have the church as mother cannot have God as father. These people, once again, can't stand the Catholic church. They work regularly to destroy her. Our churches are being burned. They're being closed down. People are running away. They're being martyred. Oh, they love the church. They don't have God as their father without the church as their mother. St. Cyprian, father of the church. It's in the catechism, the new one. St. Augustine says, one possesses the Holy Ghost to the extent he loves the church of Christ. Does anyone who hates the church of Christ possess the Holy Ghost? Absolutely not. Enough said. It's clear. 
Our Lord said, Go out into the whole world and teach them everything I have taught you. Not part of it. The whole thing. And baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Don't go out and pray alongside a bunch of strange religions. You'll be hard-pressed to find that in the revealed doctrine of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us live by the solid Trinitarian theology that tells us the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son. That He is not an alternate path to the Father, but instead compels us to be another Christ. Let us embrace the long-standing tradition of the saints and unite our sufferings to Christ on Calvary made present in the Holy Mass. Let us embrace the truth in its fullness and completeness in Christ. And we will have the Holy Ghost who is the love of God. May we not be counted among those who camp out at the bottom of the mountain, not allowing ourselves to be drawn up with Christ and Him crucified. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.